First of all, just say that I'm coming from the Design Innovation Research Centre, which incorporates the Designing Out Crime project that was created 10 years ago by Case Dorst, uh, winning some funding from government there. So it's had a standing contract with the New South Wales Department of Justice to try and do crime prevention. And it was a very early example, although not as early as the Design Against Crime, which already existed, but an early example of bringing design innovation to a kind of social problem. Uh, and uh, that is now sort of everywhere in that the whole world has been consumed by design thinking and the idea that you can just kind of throw design at anything. Uh, whereas back in those days, you had to kind of argue for why on earth designers would have anything to say in that kind of project. And what was interesting was that the, the, the methodological processes that Case and all the colleagues that he was working with developed in order to win the right to be in that space is kind of contained in the name itself, Design Against Crime, Designing Out Crime. Uh, designing Out Crime is obviously a paradox in that it contains in its very title the thing that it's actually trying to refuse to deal with. So it's sort of a stupid, classically designed gesture. Uh, and it's trying to reframe the problem of crime. It's trying to say that you can't deal with crime issues, which are obviously primary motivating problems, apparently, in our society that everybody fears and the government spend vast amounts of money on or rather give to private corporations to deal with. It's this problem, but you can't deal with the problem in the way it's currently framed. So you need to sort of find other ways of preventing crime. You need to find other ways of disaffording crime. And that word there obviously makes it a really interesting design problem. Like as soon as you put affordance in it, it becomes a design problem. So Case has spent a lot of time promoting the idea that this work enabled the creation of a particular kind of designing that focuses on problem reframing. So he calls it frame innovation, frame creation. So a lot of the projects which, do, which we do at the Design Innovation Research Centre are not at all design-driven innovation in the Vaganti sense, uh, but much more about trying to reframe problems. And we've already heard Adam talking a little bit about this kind of idea of inherited problems uh, versus who gets to be in the participation of how to kind of deal with the problem and whether you're dealing with the uh, symptom or a root cause. These are all obviously the conversations that frequently occur around social design. And I, I wanted to therefore say I'm, I'm less interested in some of the conversations that we've been having already, which to me are the types of conversation that say we generally need to get better at doing politics in everything. And so quite often I hear conversations around social design and particularly this question around social design and its politics. And I think what you are saying is true of any profession. We need more politics in architecture. We need more politics in law lawyering. We need more politics in medical care. Like, we need more politics. We need agonism. We need the capacity for to, to be participation. We need a lot more politics everywhere. So I'm less interested in that wider one. And I'm trying to get at what is particular about design and its politics when it's doing social design. And so this first one I want to draw attention to is this question of problem framing. A lot of designers are kind of loath to admit that what they're actually doing is a kind of problem solving. It's uh, apparently a, a, an instrumental reduction of design to consider it as a type of problem solving. I, not being a designer, love the idea that it's actually trying to solve and respond to problems. I agree that often we're trying to resolve or shift the nature of the situation rather than solve it. Obviously, solutionism is part of the problem. But I think that when you start realizing that social design spends a lot of its time making a social issue into something that is design relevant by turning it into a particular kind of problem, all of a sudden you can start to see what is particular about the politics of social design. That social design is an act of reframing problems or more, and I think this is almost more important, it is the act of what, you know, Foucault used to call problematization. Its job is to go and make something feel problematic that doesn't currently feel problematic. Like its job is to be creative. Its job is to get in there and say, society thinks the problem is crime. Ooh, criminals. They've got such weird psychologies and they are a threat everywhere. We need penal systems 
we need to turn everybody into a surveillance system. All of this is a particular version of a problem which is not helpful. And the job of the designer as a creative individual and as somebody who risks taking leadership in relation to that discourse is to come in and reframe the problem or find that the problem is somewhere else. And that is political because you have to argue for it. Designers, I think, are ill-educated. They don't spend enough time debating because the job of a designer is to persuade people to change the way they see a problem or to see a problem where there is not currently a problem. And a lot of designers are really good at doing that and that leads to a whole lot of crap everywhere, right? Because they go around convincing people that they have a problem with their toaster or a problem with their driverless car or something. And so then somebody develops the solution to that, which is sort of Morisov's original kind of definition of solutionism in the sense that it's a, a solution looking for, a, it's, it's a way of framing problems so that they look like this technology is the solution. But I just want to draw attention to this particular problem, reframing aspect of social design, just also as a self-serving way to talk about the Design Innovation Research Centre. So that's the first kind of perspective. The second perspective and here I'm going to take a particular take and say that the, the reason why social design is political or should be political and being political it should be utopian, etc. So my answer to all the questions is should be, not is, but should be. And I want a very particular should there, which is should because it is also the practice of universities. So I want to talk particularly about university-based social design which Adam and I and Lorraine and others and the Social Design Institute hosting this particular uh, event, uh, we are all doing this from a university. So I want to talk particularly about that. <clears throat> I think what is interesting about design as politics, just to say this very quickly, is that uh, I would just totally go with Latour's definition that design is politics made durable, that design does politics by materialising it. So design is the thing that recognises the politics of artefacts in Langdon Winner's sense and designers make interventions into society by materialising particular politics, particular versions of problems and serving particular kinds of people, which is why the question of participation and inclusion is important. But designers do what Latour calls delegated morality. We make a political decision and we materialise it in a traffic light that tells when you can go as opposed to when other people can't go. So we do a very particular version of material politics. And often in the current vogue for design thinking, which does not have a material practice other than coloured post-it notes, and the one that really I think overplays things that are not particular to designers, which are facilitation or engagement in that version of the politics that Lorraine was referring to as 1970s, those sort of aspects I think often miss this material component by which social design does politics. So I always want to think about the designer as doing politics rather than the design thinker doing politics. And I think it's fairly obvious to say that we can see the problem here in that the version of design that governments have absorbed with their policy labs, etc., is the design thinking version and not the material one. Now, the material one, and this gets to the academic point, and I'll try and be quick about this, the material one is a difficult argument to make. It is still in dispute, despite how long ago Langdon Winner wrote his, his article, Do uh, artifacts, have, artifacts Have Politics? It's still in dispute to talk about the agency of things. It's still in dispute to say that things act politically upon people. We don't really understand what that influence is. We worry about modernist determinism and behaviourism. We have this weird word that we borrowed for an obscure ecological perception theorist uh, called affordance, and that's like as much as we're prepared to risk, like we have material agency through affordance. So we don't actually understand this agency, which is the agency by which designers do politics. Which means that whenever designers do politics, they do still always have to argue for why they are in the room. And that argument is a pragmatic argument about why it is that you should have a designer looking at an intractable social problem in the first place. And secondly, it is an academic argument. It is an argument that we need to have with our colleagues in sociology and anthropology, with our colleagues in psychology. We need to be having this argument. We don't, as a discipline, have a very good account of this agency, which is the essential version of the politics that we do as material social designers. 
So social design always has to be academic. And I say that, again, polemically, because in my experience over the last 10, 15 years, the social design courses in universities, and this is not only my argument, it's an argument of my former colleague Shane Agate at Parsons, that social design courses have displaced design theory courses. In the sense that the way I teach my students, it's so hard to get them to read. So what I do is I just send them to go and collaborate with the community. They'll learn something about politics that way. And I think this is a really dangerous thing that has happened in the way in which universities have taken up and done social design. Social design must be a discipline that is developing really careful understandings of how it is operating politically. We've seen lots of different examples of it. We've seen socially responsive design. Uh, we've seen transformation design. Uh, some of the work that was sort of being written around that area, it's been recovered now uh, uh, recently in a kind of Birkhauser collection. And then obviously we have transition design. So I did just want to say, I really, I really think that design is a very particular material agency, but that material agency is not well understood. And that's why social design needs to be an academic subdiscipline. And then the last thing I'll just refer to very quickly is uh, the work that I've been doing with colleagues at Carnegie Mellon and now with many people around the world taking it up in relation to transition design. So transition design is an overblown title for an ambition. Uh, and that ambition draws on one kind of version of a theory of change, which is you need to work at multiple levels simultaneously. So it's an easy thing to say, and it is impossibly hard to do because it means being a social designer is exhausting. You need to be solving existing problems, and you need to be reframing the problems, and you need to be engaged in formal representational politics to create the capacity to legislate those reframed problems so that we can solve those in the future. You need to be operating at multiple levels, solving the problems, reframing the problems, and actually being a politician itself. So transition design names that ambition that we teach designers to function at multi-level, that whenever they have a client or a particular community, a particular collaborator, they never only just work on that version of the problem, they work on that version of the problem and do 10 other things simultaneously, which is exhausting, but we're in an emergency. Thank you and goodbye.